Hey, it's uh, checking out some here. Um, I changed a little bit as far as my setting here. And uh, I am thinking about transferring my uh, textbook MMT that I've been doing on my anchor uh, to be on here because uh, here I can do it longer than 30 minutes. And uh, so anyway, kind of just uh, see what kind of response I get uh, from my listeners uh, in this case. Uh, anyway, so let's get to it. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, uh, follow, and uh, go to realprogressives.org for more uh, MMT-related material, uh, podcasts, um, and other things like that. You can also check out uh, the Luke Parker, Parker Show on YouTube. You can also check out, um, let's see, uh, Stephen Grumbine, uh, Ray, Are You Ready to Grumble? Uh, status Co. You can also check out him also on Macro and Cheese, where he interviews different people uh, from different walks of life in regards to finances, uh, pretty much anything and everything. Uh, the Macro and Cheese you check on realprogressives.org. Uh, YouTube has uh, a rated rumble and, and also has um, Lou Parker Show uh, also on YouTube, and I will try to provide those. Uh, links at, uh, in the description below, but anyway, let's get to it. Let's see. And I'm continuing uh, my reading from uh, the Macroeconomics uh, textbook uh, by William Mitchell, L. Randall Ray, and Martin Watts. Uh, anyway, so let's see. I'm still on the first uh, chapter. Uh, again, I was doing this on Anchor, which was only allows about 30 minutes. Uh, and so that's what I'm doing here. Anyway, uh, so it's in macro model, which is on uh, the lower page. If you if you have a book, which I hope you do, uh, is on page 12 and the bottom portion. Macro model, the to organize uh, our thinking about macroeconomics relationships. So we use a conceptual structure, sometimes referred to in the economics uh, literature as a model. In this case, a macroeconomic model, uh, wait, blah, 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 or oh, we got lost. <laughs> okay, so let's say uh, li uh, literature as a model, in this case, a macroeconomic model. A model is a organ uh, organizing framework and represents a uh, simplification of the system that, it, that is being uh, investigated. In this textbook, we will develop a macroeconomic model that combines narrative and other algebra to advance your understanding of the real world economic operate uh, how the, the real world economic operates. I'm not very good at algebra, algebra, so who knows? Well, that's, we will necessarily simplify where complexity hinders cl uh, clarity. That, uh, but we will always focus on the real world rather than assume the abstraction that has no relevance to the actual economy. All disciplines developed their own language as a way of communicating. One might think that this just makes it harder to understand the ideas, and we we have symp uh, sympathy for that view. But we also understand how useful it will be for students at a specific discipline. In this case, macroeconomics to be somewhat uh, conversant uh, with the language of this of the discipline and they are studying. In chapter seven, methods, tools, and techniques, we present the essential analytical techniques and terminology that are used to specify and solve macroeconomic models throughout this book. These tools and techniques are also deployed in the practical exercise that accompanies, oh, sorry, the that accompany this text and are to be found on the internet homepage for the book, which is uh, Macmillan, uh, com slash Mitchell uh, minus sign macro. Uh, chapter 7 should be consult uh, consulted regularly. The macroeconomic model draws on concepts and algebra, algebra, I guess, techniques to advance our understanding of the there we go, main economic aggregates, such as output, employment, and, pr and price level. This textbook design to, is unique because it specifically develops the modern monetary theory macroeconomic model, which will inform economic policy debates. 
we introduce that approach in the next subsection, which is the one I'm going to read now. Uh, okay, so let's see. Mo uh, the MMP approach to macroeconomics. Uh, modern monetary theory, or MMT, is distinguished from other approaches to macroeconomics because it places the monetary arrangements at the center of the analysis. As we will see, MMT builds on the insights of many economists who have worked in the heterodox tradition. It therefore rejects the main perception of the orthodox and neoclassical approach to macroeconomics. However, because it is placed, or because it places, excuse me, an emphasis on monetary arrangements within the capitalist economy, it adds new insights that would not provide previously in available within the heterodox trading or tradition, excuse me. Learning macroeconomics from an MMT perspective requires you to under understand how money works in the modern economy and to develop a conceptual structure for an analyzing, analyzing excuse me, the economics, uh, the economy as it actually exists. By placing government as the currency issuer at the center of the monetary system, the MMT approach immediately focuses on how a government spends and how that spending influences those aforementioned macroeconomic aggregates that we seek to explain. The framework will first provide a general analysis of government spending that applies to all currency exchange rate systems before explaining the constraints or policy options that apply to governments as we move from a flexible exchange rate to a fixed exchange rate system. We will consider how the design of the monetary system impacts on the domestic policy choices open to oh yeah open to government and the outcomes of specific policy choices in terms of output and employment and inflation. The most important conclusion which by MMT is that the issuer of a currency faces no financial constraints. But put simply, a country that issues its own currency can never run out and can never become insolvent in its own, uh, cur oh, its own currency. It can make all payments as they come due for this reason. It makes no sense to compare a sovereign government's finance with those of a household or a firm. Households and firms are users of the currency. They must obtain the currency in order to make payments as they come due. They must either earn income or borrow or sell assets to obtain the currency. They can be forced to default. But the sovereign currency issuer can never run out of its own currency. In the, in the later chapters, we... Uh, will explain how sovereign currency issuers spend and why they can always afford anything that is for sale if it is in priced in their own currency. There is a caveat, however, even a foreign currency issuer can tie its own can tie its own hands. This occurs if the government promises to deliver pr uh, precious metals such as gold or a foreign currency in payment. It is not uncommon for a government uh, for governments to issue debt denominated in foreign currency. This is especially true of a developing nation or nations. In this case, they must obtain the foreign currency to service their debts. In the in the past, many governments promised to exchange their own currencies for gold or silver. So again, they had no, they had to obtain the gold or silver to meet these promise, promises. Thus, why these governments cannot run out of their own currencies. They can certainly run out of the precious metal or foreign currencies and then be forced to default on their promise to make payments in precious metal or foreign currency. Many people are unaware that a major historical event occurred in 1971 when President Nixon, U.S. President Nixon, abandoned gold convertibility and ended the system of fixed exchange rates that had existed in the Brenton Woods International Monetary System since the Second World War. 
under that system as well as under the gold standard. System, uh, there we go, uh, that had existed uh, since the late 19th, uh, 19th century with, with breaks for both world wars. Currency were convertible into gold and exchange rates were fixed into, uh, to a to U.S. dollar. As such, they had to operate their eco uh, economies in such a manner as to uh, accumulate gold or dollars. This usually meant adopting contradictory uh, co contradiction uh, well, man, contradictory contractionary excuse me wow uh, contractionary uh, fiscal policy as well as maintaining high interest rates to ensure trade surpluses in strong currencies. However, after 1971, most of the governments floated their currencies and traded them freely on foreign currency markets. Occasionally, central banks would conduct what became known as managed float. Uh, ma uh, as a managed float, they tried to some uh, limit the uh, amplitude. Okay, uh, movements <laughs> that the free float uh, would generate. It is thus essential to understand the notion of currency regime, which can range through a continuum from a fixed exchange rate system to a floating exchange rate system, which, or sorry, system with varying degrees of exchange rate management and between. Understanding the way the exchange rate is set is important because it allows us to appreciate the various policy options that a currency issuing government has in relation to influencing the main objectives of our study. Employment, output, and inflation. Okay, that was all the other there. Uh, it also allows us to deepen our understanding of the policy options available to a government which chooses to use a foreign currency such as the member states of the Economic and Monetary Union or the, uh, or the Eurozone. A flexible exchange rate releases monetary policy from the defending from defending a fixed par uh, parity. Not to be confused with uh, parity, uh, P A R I T Y. Just so you know, exchange rate against a foreign currency. Fiscal and monetary policy can then concentrate or yeah, concentrate on ensuring domestic spending is sufficient to maintain high levels of employment. A consequence of this is that governments that issue their own currencies need no longer accumulate large reserves of foreign currencies to, de to defend their exchange rates. The reality is that currency issuing governments such as those of Australia, Britain, Japan, and USA can never run out of money. Then these governments always have the capacity to spend in their own currency. And I'll be right back. I'm William Pounds, independent Green Party candidate for Arizona governor, and I want to encourage everybody to volunteer with Voter Choice Arizona. I am a huge proponent of ranked choice voting because it completely eliminates the spoiler argument. Please click the link in the description to find out more. I'm William Pounds, Independent Green Party candidate. Hey, welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue on. However, most of the analysis appear in a macroeconomics textbook, which filters into the public debate and underpins the culture of austerity and is derived from the gold standard logic and does not apply to modern fiat uh, monetary systems. The economic policy ideas that dom dominate the current uh, debate are artifacts from the old system, which uh, was abandoned in 71. One of the most basic propositions in macroeconomics that MMP emphasizes in the in is the notion that at the 
aggregate level total spending equals total income and total output. In turn, total employment is related to uh, the total outputs in uh, output in the economy. So to understand employment and output determined determination, we need to understand that drives total depend, uh, de spending and how that generates income, output, and demand for that for labor. In this context, we will consider the movement or behavior and interactions of the two economic sectors, government and non-government. Then we will uh, unpack the non-government sector into its component sectors, the private uh, domestic sector, consumption and our uh, investment, which is basically what that is, and the external sector uh, or trade and capital flows. In Chapter 4, we analyze in detail the so-called national accounts drawing on those broad macroeconomic sectors. This approach <clears throat> is called the uh, sectoral balance approach and builds on the accounting rule that a government deficit or surplus must be exactly offset by a surplus or a deficit. In the Non-government uh, government sector, the non-government sector um, comprises the private, domestic, and inter uh, external sectors. So a more general observation is that the sum of the sectoral balance nets to zero when considered the government, private, domestic, and external sectors. If one sector spends more, more than its income, at least one of the others must spend less than its income because... For the economy as a whole, total spending must equal total receipts or income. While there is no reason why any of one sector has to run a balance between its spending and income, the National Accounts uh, Framework shows that the system as a whole must often know, but not always, the private domestic sector runs a surplus or spending less than its income. This is how this is how it accumulates net financial wealth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, overall private sector uh, savings or surplus is a, le a leakage from the overall expenditure cycle that must be ma matched by an injection of spending from another sector. The current account balance, the external uh, sector account, is uh, as a leakage that drains domestic demand. A current account deficit all occurs when the domestic uh, econo economy is spending more overseas than foreigners are spending in the domestic economy. These concepts are developed in Chapter 6. Here, uh, here it is useful to differentiate between a stock and a flow. The latter is a magnitude per period of time. For example, spending is always a flow of currency per period for example, households might have spent $100 billion in the first three months of 2018. On the other hand, a stock is measured at a point in time. For example, a student financial wealth could have consisted of a deposit account at a local bank with a deposit of, or uh, with a balance, excuse me, of $1,000 on January 1st of 2018. We explain stocks and flows in more detail in four and six of chapters. <clears throat> okay, so now on uh, page 15, the sectoral balance framework shows that a sectoral deficit a flow per year, say, accumulates as a matter of accounting to a financial debt uh, a stock. On the other hand, a sequence of sectoral surpluses accumulates to a financial asset, which is also a stock. MMT is thus based on what is known as a stock flow consistent approach to a macroeconomics by which all flows and resulting stocks are accounted for in ex exhaustive fashion. <clears throat> Too much talking. No. Uh, <laughs> actually, I haven't talked in a while as far as on, as far as on mic, so. <clears throat> anyway, so let's see. The failure to inherit to a stock flow consistent consistent approach can lead to erroneous and analytical conclusions and poor policy design.
from the perspective of fiscal policy choices, an important aspect of the stock flow consistent approach that will be explained in very detail in Chapter 6 is that one sector's spending flow equals to its equals its income flow plus changes to its financial balance or stock of assets. This textbook will show that a country can only run a current account deficit if the rest of the world wishes to accumulate financial claims on the nation uh, or financial debt. The MMT framework also shows that for most governments, there is no default risk on government debt and therefore such a situation is sustainable and should not necessarily be interpreted to be undesirable. Any, ass, uh, any assessment of the fiscal position of a nation must be taken in the light of the usefulness of the government's spending program in achieving its national social economic goals. <clears throat> this is what Abba Lerner uh, in 1943 called a functional finance approach. Rather than adopting some desired fiscal outcome or a relationship between spending and taxation revenue, a government ought to be or ought to spend and tax with a view to achieving fu functional defined outcomes such as full employment. On matters of te terminology, we avoid using the term budget to describe the spending and taxation outcomes for the currency issuing government. Instead, we use the term fiscal balance. A government fiscal deficit occurs when its spending exceeds its taxation revenue, whereas a fiscal surplus occurs when, that, when government spending is less than its taxation revenue. The use of ter uh, the term budget to describe the fiscal balance invokes the idea that the currency issuing government of the monetary system will, will, be, will make it obvious that, wait a minute, uh, I messed that one up that the currency issuing government faces the same financial constraints as a household when it, when it is forming its budget. A careful understanding of the monetary system will make it obvious that the government is not a big household. The government can consistently spend more than its revenue because it decreased the currency. Households use the currency issued by the government and must finance their spending. Their access is constrained by the source of available funds, including income from all sources, assets, sales, and borrowings from external parties, whereas households have to save or spend less than they earn to spend more in the future. Governments can purchase whatever they like as long as there are, good, uh, there are goods and services for sale in the currency they issue. A sovereign government must spend before it can subsequently tax or borrow. A household cannot spend uh, more than its revenue indefinitely because continuously increasing private debt is unsustainable. I think the I think the main word there is private debt or yeah private debt is uh, is unsustainable. The budget choices facing a household are thus limited and prevent permanent deficits. A currency issuing government can never be revenue constrained in a technical sense and can sustain deficits indefinitely without solvency risk. In other words, our own personal budget experience uh, generates no knowledge that a that is relevant to the consideration of government matters. This alternative narrative, which we rep which we present in this book, highlights the special characteristics of the government's currency monopoly. Fiscal surpluses, which arise when a government spending is less than the amount it takes out of the economy by way of taxation, do not provide governments with a greater capacity to meet future needs, nor do fiscal deficits erode that capacity. Governments always have the capacity to spend in their own currencies. In some area, budget surpluses force the non-government sector into deficit and the domestic private sector is forced to accumulate uh, ever-increasing levels of indebtedness to maintain its expenditure. We will explain why this is unsustainable growth strategy and have 
and, and how eventually the private the domestic sector is forced to reduce its risk debt by uh, by saving more. The resulting drop in non-government spending will reinforce the negative impact of the government's fiscal surpluses or surplus on total spending. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the fiscal and monetary policy. The two main policy tools that influence what is termed the demand or spending side of the, of the economy are monetary and fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is, rep is represented by the spending and taxation choices made by the government, the Treasury. The net financing or financial accounting uh, outcomes of these decisions are summarized periodically by announcements. Hold on, guys. Uh, by announcements of government's fiscal position, fiscal policy, uh, fiscal policy is one of the major means by which the government seeks to influence overall spending in the economy and achieve its economic and social objectives. This textbook will show that a nation will have maximum fiscal put space as capacity for government to use its uh, fiscal policy tools of spending and taxation. If it operates with a sovereign currency, that is a currency that is issued by the sovereign government and whose value is not pegged to a foreign currency, and if it avoids incurring debt in foreign currency or guaranteeing the foreign currency debt of domestic entities, uh, firms, households, and states, province, or city debts. Under these conditions, the national government can always afford to purchase anything that is available for sale in its own currency. This means that if there are unemployed resources, the government can always put them to uh, productive use with, through the use of fiscal policy. To put it as simply as possible, this means that if any that there are unemployed workers who are willing to work, a sovereign government can afford to hire them to put, to perform useful work in the public interest. As we have noted, from a macroeconomic efficiency perspective, a primary aid of public policy is to fully util, uh, utilize available resources under these optimal conditions. The government is not revenue constrained which means it does not face the financial constraints that a private household or firm faces in framing its exp exp expenditure decision. The central bank in the economy is responsible for the conduct of a monetary policy, which typically involves the setting of a short-term policy target interest rate. Since the 2008 global uh, economic crisis, the ambit of monetary policy has broadened considerably and thus developments will be considered in chapter 23. The typical roles of a central bank include not only the conduct of monetary policy via the overnight interbank lending rate, but also operating the interbank clearing mechanism so that bank check so bank checks clear among banks. Acting as a lender of last resort to stop bank runs and regulating and supervising the banks, MMP considers the Treasury and Central Bank functions to be part of what is termed the consolidating government sector. In many textbooks, students are told that the Central Bank is independent from government. The MMP macroeconomic model will demonstrate how it is important and possible for the Central Bank to work independently the Treasury and the monetary system is to operate smoothly. The policy application of MMT for sovereign nations. MMT provides a broad the uh, theoretical framework based on the recognition that sovereign currency systems are in fact public monopolies per se in that impo impo imposition of taxes coupled with insufficient government spending generates unemployment. An understanding of this point will be developed to allow the student to appreciate the role that the government can play in maintaining its near-universal dual mandates of price stability and full employment. 
The student will learn that the two broad approaches to controlling inflation are available to government designed to and designing its fiscal policy. Both approaches drawn on the concept of buffer stock control prices we will examine the differences between the two of a, a, to, between the, the use of a unemployment buffer stock, the neoclassical approach, which describes the uh, current policy orthodoxy seeks to control inflation through the use of high interest rates, tight monetary policy, and restrictive fiscal policy or austerity. It leads to a buffer stock of unemployment in chapter 17 and 18. Students will learn that this approach is very costly. It provides an unreliable target for a policymaker's pursuit as a means for inflation control. And B, employment buffer stocks. Under this approach, the government exploits its fiscal capacity, which is inherent uh, inherent uh, to in its currency issuing status to create an unemployment buffer stock. In, in MMT, this is called the job guarantee or JG approach to full employment and price stability. This model is considered by MMT to be the superior buffer stock option is explained in detail in, in chapter 19. <clears throat> the MMT macroeconomic frameworks shows that a superior use, uh, superior, superior use of the labor stock or slack, excuse me, necessary to the to achieve price stability is to implement an employment uh, program for those who are otherwise unemployed, which both anchors the general price level to the price of employment level uh, labor of this current uh, of this currently unemployed buffer and can produce useful outputs with positive supply side effects. <clears throat> so on, on page 17, there is a conclusion and references. The conclusion of this chapter has emphasized that economics uh, is a social science that studies economic life. We define the, the economy as that part of social organization that is respect, responsible for the provision of the material means of survival, food, clothing, shelter, and so on. However, the economy is always embedded in the social organization as a whole, affecting, a, a, affecting and affected by its culture. There is no single right way to do economics. Economic theories as well as economic economists excuse me themselves can be grouped into two main approaches the orthodox neoclassical approach and the heterodox Keynesian slash institutionalist slash Marxist approach. We will see that public policy recommendations that follow through each or from each of these two approaches are quite different because they are based on very different views as to how the, the economy works. The heterodox approach, for example, envisions a more important role for the government to play in ensuring that the economy works or the economy furthers the public purpose. This chapter discusses widely shared goals of public policy as um, enumerated in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights many of which are related to economic issues such as the right, right to work. <clears throat> Finally, the chapter defined the scope of macroeconomics as a study of the aggregate outcomes of economic behavior. <clears throat> the uh, MMT, uh, Monetary Th uh, Theory Approach, was introduced and distinguished from other particular MMT puts emphasis on the sovereign nation or yeah nature excuse me of currency and the policy implications that derive from the ability of a national uh, national government to issue its own currency. This is a theme that will be examined throughout this text. Now, reference uh, a learner, nineteen forty three, functional finance and federal debt, uh, social search ten uh, anyway. Uh, P. Samuelson, uh, Foundations of Economic Analysis, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University Press, United Nations, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, United Nations Central Assembly, December 10th, 1948. 
Um, and notes uh, note that the approach taken in this text, modern monetary theory, falls within this heterodox camp. Indeed, it rests upon the foundation of many of the heterodox traditions. And uh, caveat is necessary here. Many of those who call themselves Keynesians, as well as <clears throat> damn, excuse me, as well as the approach that is often presented in economics textbooks as Keynesian theory are not uh, heterodox. They are much closer to the neoclassical approach. Indeed, one of the founders of the orthodox macroeconomics theory, Paul Samuelson, uh, 1947, called it the neoclassical synthesis to indicate that a that while its foundation are neoclassical, some of the Keynesian uh, Keynes ideas are synthesizers uh, synthesis are grateful, uh, are grafted, excuse me, uh, onto the base. Uh, heterodox followers of Keynesian argue that such integration is not possible. We will revisit these issues in more in, in, uh, detail in Chapter 27. For now, uh, thanks for listening. I will talk to you tomorrow. Peace out for now.